Okay, um, thanks uh, everybody for coming. Wow, this is uh, a packed room and I'm kind of blown away. Uh, all of my talks are usually like in one of the tiny niche rooms because my talks are about like really esoteric stuff. And so this is a bit of a change for me. I decided to kind of like back up and talk about something really basic and fundamental, which is um, how do we design library interfaces? Um, so this talk, we're gonna be uh, focusing on C++ gotchas. No, no, wait a minute, that's stupid. I hate those talks. Uh, we'll talk about tips and tricks. No, I don't like that either. <laughs> we'll talk about useless and unnecessary template metaprogramming heroics. <laughs> Woo, and those of you who know me would probably be surprised that we're not actually talking about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're just going to be talking about uh, you know, best practices uh, for using C++ 11 to design library interfaces. And a lot of this stuff is going to be pretty basic for this crowd, but I'm hopefully uh, going to surprise some of you with some of my recommendations and maybe we get some interesting conversation going. Okay, so uh, here's how it's going to break down. First we're going to be talking about functions, and we're going to be talking about classes, and then we're going to be talking about like uh, you know, larger scale designs, modules, we'll have to fake it up. Um, okay. So first, functions. When you write a function, whether C++ 98 or C++ 11, these are some things that you might want to think about when you're writing a function that's intended to be reused, which is like every function. Okay. Is it easy to call correctly? Hard to call incorrectly? Efficient to call with minimal copying and aliasing without unnecessary resource allocation? Is it easily composable with other functions? And is it usable in higher order constructs? Right. These are the kinds of things that you want to think about when you're writing reusable functions. And let's, let's get really, really basic and talk about like, what's the best way to get stuff into and out of a function? And just get more basic than this, right? Um, and before we talk about C++ 11, let's go back in time and talk about C++ 98, and what was the way to do that back then. Okay, so this is kind of a you know, chart that I came up with to describe like how you might wanna do like parameter passing and function re return in C++ 98. You've got input parameters and output parameters, and you've got in-out parameters. If the input parameter is small, you'd probably pass it by value, and if it's large, you'd pass it by const ref. And if it's an output parameter, you'd return it by value. And if it's large, you'd probably pass it as an out parameter to the function by non-const ref. And in out parameters, also, you'd probably pass by non-const ref. So kind of like best practice for C++ 98 function interfaces, like who would code by a rule of thumb sort of like this? Just about everybody has done this, pretty much. So we want to talk about, like, how is this going to change in C++ 11? Okay. And in order to do that, I'll have to talk about move semantics a little bit, not all that much. Um, so don't be scared. But let's break this down just a little bit more. Let's talk about input categories, and let's break it down into read-only and sync. Read-only, a read-only input parameter to a function is something that you obviously only read from. You never modify it locally in the function. You never store it anywhere or anything. You just read from it, okay? And a sync is a value that's consumed, stored, or mutated while that function executes, okay? So a good example of a read-only would be, say, uh, an OStream inserter. You only ever read from, hopefully, you only ever read from stuff when you're writing an OStream inserter. And, you know, here, you know, say you've got a task queue and you've got a task and presumably this function in queue is going to take a task and put it in the queue, okay? So the task will probably be saved somewhere here. Okay, so let's look uh, more closely at this read-only stuff. Here's my first guideline for the talk. It's okay to continue taking uh, in read-only input parameters by const ref, okay? If you've got a small one, you could pass it by value. It's fine, okay. Okay, sync arguments. The goal is to avoid making unnecessary copies of your objects. Okay, 
by allowing your temporaries to be moved in. So you might think about writing in Q like this. Okay, I've got you know a, an L value task and an R value task. Okay, and if we've got this code over here, we've got a function that makes tasks and a task and a task queue. This would call the copy and copy it in, and this would move it in. Okay. Well, this is pretty great, right? I mean, we don't pay for any unnecessary copies, and we're moving stuff in, and that's supposedly pretty cheap, so that's pretty exciting. Marshall? Yeah, there's one important difference here in these, in these two cases from a, um, in, now that we have multi-threading. Um, in the second one, the one that takes by R value reference, the, uh, the routine NQ can assume that, uh, that the, the task that gets passed to it is actually will never change during the run of the, of the program, and run of the routine. And this first one that takes it by const reference can't assume that. OK, so the question is, um, so in the, the comment, uh, this function can probably, uh, is, it's safe to assume that you know, there's not going to be a race on the, uh, the thing passed in. And uh, here, you might have to worry about that. And I say that's not actually true, right? Because I can std move something, or I could cast an L value to an R value, right? And get aliasing behavior just as easily on an R value as you can on an L value. Yeah? Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> You hope that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You're certainly saying it's okay to steal the guts of this object. Yeah. Which is necessarily a mutating operation. Okay. Yeah. I guess my point would be that if either one of these could be, if you, could, if you pass an object to either one of these that could be modified on a different thread, you're doing something wrong. Probably. Yeah. The, the point being that, you know, you, yeah, yeah, you, sh you shouldn't. Right, so uh, you're probably doing something wrong if you're worried about race conditions here. Okay, so um, this seems pretty great. Uh, it seems like you know programmer heaven, right? We're only uh, paying for uh, what we're what we need to. Um, so so let's think about uh, what happens if you take more than one sync argument to your function. Okay, well this is clearly not sufficient. No, nothing's going to get moved in this case. Right, so let's let's just permute, okay? Well, this isn't heaven, okay? This really sucks. Uh, we don't want to have to do this, right? Okay, so what's the correct thing to do? The simple thing to do? Anybody? Pass it by value. It's simple and it works, okay? Now, who's going to be the wise guy in the audience? You. Break the assumption of what will happen, how this value is going to be used into the interface, which is a bad idea generally. Okay, I'm not sure I understand that point. You, uh, it, it was said that you'd break the assumption of the interface? The assumption about whether it's a sync or, or a value that you just read from into the interface. Let's imagine this is a virtual function, yeah. a pure virtual function, and you don't know how it's exactly going to be implemented. Now you assume that it's going to be a sync, while the implementation might use it in a different way. Okay, that's actually a fair point. So if this is um, you know, a virtual function that uh, is meant to be overridden by derived classes, and the derived classes may or may not be making copies, uh, then um, the point is uh, you might not actually want this to be like baked into the interface. Okay, and that's a fair point. Okay, that would be like um, you know, a, a consideration. Yeah, go ahead, follow up. not going to work for polymorphic objects, you're going to slice it. Right, okay, so for polymorphic objects you're going to slice, but uh, Sean has given great talks about, well, you know, the you know, concept-based polymorphism and value semantics and, you know, why you might want to consider designing your types that way. So I, I would highly recommend, like, Googling uh, Sean's talk, concept-based polymorphism. It was very illuminating. Thank you, Sean. Uh, yeah, Kirk. There you go. That's the wise guy answer that I was looking for. Um, 
so so you're going to get two moves uh, sometimes when uh, you know if you wrote it the other way, oh, you'd only get one. And I say I don't care. I really don't. Um, and I don't think you should either, uh, Chandler. Moves. Yeah, so Chandler, Chandler says, Chandler says, change the standards so you don't get two moves, which is fine. I'd be okay with that too. But even even without that change to the language, like seriously, I don't care, you know. Okay. So uh, this is my guideline. Take sync arguments by value, you know, unless you have some like extenuating circumstance. This is generally good advice when designing interfaces. Any other questions about this? No. Uh, yeah. I was just going to point out to me, um, a sink is very, very clear. If you can get away with the heat by using a unique pointer, and then it's perfectly clear what's going on. So you could, uh, you could use a unique pointer for a sink. Um, personally, I don't like pointers at all, sure. smart or dumb. Um, but it screams sink at you. Yeah, it does. It screams sink. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now, uh, yeah, doing always at least a, a move uh, when you, you have the, the two interfaces with the Q, post reference and the uh, L, uh, about reference, you, you, you have. Okay, so, so, so the point was made that uh, um, when you ha had an L value, you didn't have to make a copy, and you could just call this thing. But now if you have an L value, it's going to be copied in, right? Um, good, right? Because this is an NQ function, and that's a sync argument. What you're going to be doing, presumably, you've got some Q inside this task Q object, maybe a vector of tasks. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to take that argument that you've been passed, and you're going to move it into the vector. So if you don't have this thing by value, so say this function took a const ref. You have to make a copy within the NQ function. A copy has to happen one way or the other. Yeah? Would this be the same advice if task were a template parameter? Would um, you pass by value if it were intended to be a sync argument? OK, so that's a good question. If you don't actually know that this object, that your object you're enqueuing has uh, you know, a cheap, is cheap to move, do you still do it? Do you still pass by value? I say yes. Um, I want everyone to write move constructors. I want objects that are cheap to copy. And um, if, the, uh, if you're using uh, an expensive to copy type with this interface, then there are ways to get around that. Um, you can encapsulate a expensive object by putting it on the heap and uh, creating a wrapper and moving the wrapper in. Um, but I encourage people to design their libraries and their classes so that types are cheap to move. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, a follow up by the last part. Um, the, if, if the task is an L value, you say that the goal, because finally you are going to copy the thing to the queue. Yes. Okay, so, so the observation was, depending on how NQ is, is implemented, it may or may not make a copy of the task. Uh, and, and if that is the case, uh, then you can't do this. Yeah. So does this eliminate any data race possibilities like we were worried about before? It looks like it does. Does it eliminate data races? Well, I'll say it, it certainly eliminates aliasing, right? That if you pass things in by value, you know you're the only one holding it, right? So you don't have to worry about aliasing problems. And yeah, I mean, it, it does simplify the implementation of NQ if you are worried about threading issues. Yeah? I mean, the, the original point, like if the object did change while the copy was going on, you'd still have a data race problem, but that's... Uh, that too. That's, but that, that problem would, would happen outside of NQ. It's not NQ's problem.
at that point. Yeah? Don't you think that this is just kind of a, a workaround for a language limitation? And what we actually want is a universal reference where you can check inside NQ whether it's a, a, an R value or L value. So uh, do I think this is a workaround for a language limitation where, like, I should be able to say, like, task L value or R value. And then, yeah, check within inside NQ, did I get an R value or an L value? Um, and it's really awkward to do that today with universal references. Um, unfortunately, that's not the language that we have. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I could imagine a different language design that would make this easier. But I don't have a problem with this personally. Yeah. Right. So, so the observation was if, um, like I had said, I don't like pointers, and then I said, well, you could actually wrap expensive objects by putting them on the heap. The wrapper that you would create for that expensive object that's on the heap would present a value like interface and have value like semantics. How it's implemented is really beside the point. Yeah. Chandler. I, I just want to say I I don't think this is a, a, a language limitation or defect or anything of the kind. When you have a sync argument, what you were saying is that the implementation of NQ needs a private copy of the value. A by value argument is precisely that. Yes. I cannot imagine a more natural way to represent this. Yeah. So Chandler's point is, well, I, the semantics of this function was I, I need a value here that I can then enqueue. And this is the way to express value in the language. And it's natural. Yeah. Can I just give a, a, a concrete example? Let's say we have a, a, a set or a hash where and the function is insert, which checks whether the value already exists. and if if it doesn't, then it, it moves it into the hash, and if, if not, then it's ignored. So, you know, in, in one case, it's a sync, and in another case, it's, it's not. It's just a, yeah. a read-only. So, you know, they, here's an example where you don't really know whether it's a sync or not. Yeah. I, I have a lot of slides to get to, and I know you guys are, <laughs> I know you guys are super interested in this, and I, I'm sorry, I'm cutting off the discussion. So, I'm just going to move on, okay? So take this or leave it. I think you should take it, but I'm, I'm moving on. Okay, so, so here's what we have so far. Input parameters, small and sync, passed by value, all others, passed by const ref. And since uh, we have uh, cheap to move types, so I think output parameters should be returned by value. Um, and now we have these weird like input output parameters. Uh, we haven't really said anything about them yet. Pass them by non-const ref, I mean, I guess, right? That's kind of unsatisfying, right? Because it hurts composability. And what do I mean by that? Okay, let's talk about getLine, my favorite whipping boy. <laughs> um, this is a standard thing, right? You pass in a stream and a, you know, it's an out parameter, so you pass in a you know, reference to a std string that you're then gonna fill in. Um, and here's, you know, it's kind of interesting. How come getLine doesn't return a line? Well. There are reasons for that, but okay. So this is how you're supposed to use get line. You're supposed to like default construct a string so that you can pass it into get line by non-const reference, and then you use a line. So you can't immediately use the result, and that's kind of an awkward and annoying and non-composable interface, and we'd like to do something about this. Think like, wouldn't it be great if get line like returned a line, right? Imagine like get line returns a line, I could just, get a line and use it, right? I don't have to declare a variable, right? That's pretty nice, right? Anybody see a problem with this? Oh, God, yeah. Well, you cannot check whether it failed. Okay, you can't check where it, whether it failed. That's like, you know, the brain dead reason. There's other, other reason, there's another reason, yeah. Yeah, well, I read your blog. Your oh, someone who hasn't read my blog, <laughs> yeah. You've read my blog. <laughs> You've seen this talk before, what the hell? <laughs> You don't count. Anybody else? Yeah. You're allocating tons of strings. You're allocating tons of strings. Yes, exactly. So here's how it's typically used, okay? Typically, you declare a line, 
and then you get a whole bunch of lines, one after another, right? And okay, you read the first line, and now you're going to allocate some space for it, and then you use it, and then you read another line, and maybe that line is shorter than the first. You don't have to allocate more memory for it. You just fill in the string, right? And as this goes, you don't need to allocate any more memory or create new strings. This is way faster. This is a much more efficient interface. Well, that's pretty interesting. So this kind of led me to uh, an interesting insight. Like, this is not an out parameter, right? It looks like an out parameter, but it's not. It's actually an in-out parameter because on the way in, we use the capacity of the string, OK? And this puts get line in a really interesting category of algorithms, right? There are algorithms that can be more efficient if they like cache or pre-compute something, right? They are stateful algorithms. So here's how I would do this. Get lines, notice the plural here, returns a range of lines. Fetches the lines lazily on demand, okay? And this lines range object, it has a data member inside of types that string that gets reused, right? And this thing has begin and end, and it returns iterators. And as you iterate through this thing, it's going to pull lines out of my stream, like this. I didn't have to pre-declare some default constructed string object just so I could pass it in by non-const reference. You know, this is really composable. I mean, lots of people have been talking about ranges this week, and you know, if you went to Chandler's talk, you know, like, okay, this is a range, and I can. I can now filter my lines, and I can transform my lines. Well, that's pretty great. This interface is a lot more powerful, and it's a lot easier to use, I think. OK. You can re read more about that on my blog. OK, so let's get back to this idea of stateful algorithms. OK? Stateful algorithms, like they, they cache or pre-compute something. So do you want to write an interface where you force your users to declare state and then pass the state in every time you call the algorithm? Well, it's, it's state. Like, we're C++ programmers, and we know how to deal with state. We encapsulate state in an object. OK? So encapsulate an algorithm state in an object that implements the algorithm. I kind of think of this as like an algorithm object. Kind of like a function object, although it doesn't necessarily have a function call operator. But it, it does implement some sort of an algorithm. OK? The lines range is one of them. Boost has this Boyer Moore search object, which pre-computes some data and uses it to speed up string searching. OK? And so Boyer Moore computes stuff and stores it internally so that as you call this algorithm repeatedly, that cache gets reused. It's very fast. OK. So here's the new recommendation. Input and all others, you know, we've got value by ref, return by value, input output, use a stateful algorithm object. And if your algorithm object requires some initial state, well, naturally, you're going to pass that to that object's constructor. And that's a sync parameter. So you pass it in by value. OK? This is, I think, the most important slide on the talk. You know, put this by your monitor. Design interfaces this way. Nobody does. I really would like it if they did. Yeah. OK. Any questions about this? So you're saying uh, if you have to declare object parameter, the state will have an object. In that case, change it to, to the end algorithm object? Or Turn it into a, uh, yeah, put the state inside an object that implements the algorithm. Yeah. I'll repeat the question. The question was, so like, if you have an in -out input output parameter, uh, transform that algorithm with the input output parameter into an object, and that input output parameter becomes state in that object. Okay? And you return that as well. And you, you could, yes, you could, if, if that state is interesting after the algorithm completes, then you can return it. You can either move it out, you can copy it out, whatever you want. Okay? Question. When do you use R value reference? When do you use R value reference? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you pay for R value reference? Uh, 
Wow. That was, that was amazing. Yeah. Thank you. So it's really interesting. When you got this new language feature, and I'm telling you, like, never, ever use it because you don't need it. Well, that's not actually true. You do need it in exactly two places. Well, okay, two and a half, right? You need it to implement move constructors. You need it to implement move assignment operators. <laughs> okay? And if you need to do perfect forwarding, it's really handy for that. Um, but I'm, I'm going to talk about like why you shouldn't use R value references. So, so here's a slight variation, okay? And I know I promised no gotchas, but I, I lied. Um, so this is, this is a gotcha, and it's something that you all need to know about so that you know not to use R value references in your code. Okay. Say so you've got an enqueue function. It takes a queue and a task, and you, you think like, okay, here's, I want to optimize away a move. So I have like an L value and an R value. Okay. That looks okay. And now I say, I create a task queue, I create a task, and now I enqueue the task. Which overload gets called? It's a, it's a gotcha, so you should all know this. Um, this one gets called. Okay. Do you guys know why? Anybody? Right. So this will get deduced to task ref. Okay. So if you're like puzzling about why this is the case, if you're confused at all about why this is the case, stay away from our value references. Okay, you will do more damage than good because what this code is doing is it is stealing the guts from an L value. Oops. Yeah. So remove the first function and change standard to standard forward. So if I if I change this to sta standard forward, mm -hmm. then it yeah. then it works. Yes. Yeah. It's perfect forwarding. It's perfect forwarding. Right. And then yes. And, and he's right. You can get rid of the first function. Right. But this looks fairly innocuous. Like if these were not templates and that was just task and that was just task, it's correct. Yes. But then you add, make those template parameters and all of a sudden your code doesn't work anymore. Oops. Yeah. It's kind of evil what the committee did there. A little bit. <laughs> okay. All right. Are you I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. One is saying perfect forwarding, and one is saying R value reference. It's not R value reference, it's perfect forwarding. Right, so Michael's point is. The evilness is the overloaded. Yeah, so, so Michael's point is that ref ref actually means two things. Well, in, in a sense, <laughs> in a sense that matters, ref ref can mean two things. It could either mean this is an R value, or it could mean perfect forwarding. And in order to understand the difference, you need to know about R value references. You need to know the rules for reference collapsing. And you need to understand the rules for template argument deduction. Like, that's just way too much to know in order to use R value references correctly. So don't do it. Okay? All right. Okay, now here's perfect forwarding. This is just a pattern. This is one place where it's okay to use R value references aside from like move constructors and move assignment operators. Um, just memorize this pattern and use it as is, okay? And put that in your back pocket. Here's an interesting question. Like, say you have this invoke function that just forwards arguments to a function, a callable, right? What would be the return type here? Well, in C++11, it's decal type of this mess. But in C++14, you could say decal type auto, which is cool. Or you could just leave it off entirely, which is even better. So, progress. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're done with functions. Let's talk about classes. Um, we're going to be talking about, like, designing a class that makes the most best, best use of C++ and 11, and also allows uh, your consumers, the users of your class, to use C++ 11 idiomatically with your type. Okay, and for that we've got to think about you know so these are some things to think about. Of course, copy assign a move. Range based for is your type sort of range like? Think about iterators, right? Think about range based for. Does it compose well? Can it be used anywhere? 
You know, can it be in static storage? Can I use the type in a constant expression? Okay. Is my type well behaved with the standard library algorithms and containers? These all inform the design of your class. Okay. Can my type be copied and assigned and officially passed and returned, efficiently inserted into a std vector? I have something very specific in mind when I say that, right? Talking about no except. Can it be sorted, used in a map, an unordered map? Can it be iterated over if it's a collection? Can it be streamed or used to declare global constants? Okay, so in order to talk about this stuff, we need to talk about regular types. Um, and regular types let us reason mathematically about our code. And we care about regular types because we care about being able to reason about our code, but also because the standard library kind of assumes regularity in a lot of different places. And if we want our types to play nicely with the standard library, we should really think hard before we make our types irregular. Okay. How are they different? How have they changed in C++ 11? All right. Here's a C++ 98 regular type. You've got a default constructor and a copy constructor and a, better not throw, your destructor. Um, assignment, uh, equality comparison, less than comparison, right? Otherwise, I can't put this thing in a map and swap so I can efficiently do that thing, right? The swappy thing. And that better not throw either. Okay. Uh, in addition, you've got to satisfy these uh, semantic requirements, which is basically like you copy an object, they better compare equal, right? And if I make a copy, those copies had better be independent. I should be able to change one without changing the other. This is what it means to be a regular type. Did I get that right, Sean? Okay. <laughs> actually, no, actually, I got this from... I got this from Alex, yeah. Okay, that's actually, here's the URL, Fundamentals of Generic Programming, it's online, yeah. Okay, so in C++11, things are a little different, okay? We've got these two move operators, regular types in C++11 are movable, and they are no except movable. That's pretty important. And, well, this is interesting. I just nuked swap. Why did I nuke swap? Because I, because I have move, yeah, yeah. No and, and, the default, swap. the default swap works perfectly well for movable types, so you don't have to implement it anymore once you've implemented these two. Okay, that's pretty nice. And if you ever expect to hash these things, you know you'd have to specialize std hash. Chandler has a lot to say about that, so maybe you shouldn't. I don't know, because you'll get it wrong. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Oh, I did get this from your talk. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> See, I gave you credit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here are a couple of guidelines. Make your types regular if at all possible. And make your move types operations no except if possible. And I know this, this is, um, you know, a drum that's been beaten before. Uh, Chandler. So, so Chandler's question is, is like, how, how in the world could you design a class that doesn't have a no except move operation? Um, and I could think of like, okay, std pair, for instance, it doesn't know whether it's, its types, first and second, have move. But that's really a recursive argument. It's a recursive <laughs> argument, yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. I can I can skip this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Hmm. Okay. Uh, the claim is that std list is is very difficult to implement with no throw moves, and I'll 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 add that if you open up the standard. Std vector does not have no except 
move. And it makes me so mad. It really, <laughs> it really does. Yeah, Chandler. Have you written the paper? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did one better. I argued in person in the committee. Yeah, for this. What's that? Okay, so there's going to be a paper about like containers and no accept swaps. Yeah. yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, so you want to know whether your type is regular? Oh, yeah, question. So does that mean essentially both the move constructor and move assignment should be the flow? Yes, the question is should both, should both uh, uh, move assign and move construct be no accept? And yes, both of them. Yeah, uh, so the question is, is there any place in the library where we benefit from uh, no accept move assign? And the answer is yes. The default swap. Okay. Marshall. I have a more obscure one, and it, and it relates to vector. Uh, oh, yeah. When so, move, when you move assign, insert. When you move assign a vector, you ha and you have to assign the allocator across. Oh, okay. Yeesh. Okay, I don't think about allocators at all. Yeah, yeah so, the, so the observation is, um, I try to ignore them. Uh, like, moving allocators in the vector move assign, but we've already established that vector does not have a no accept move assign. I don't think. Oh, yes, it does. It does. It does. Yeah. If the allocator can be assigned, no accept. But the constructor, the move constructor is not. If the allocator is known for a move constructor, for a move constructible because you could pass one and allocator in. I wonder if that's an addition, a recent addition. Anyway, oh, let's take this offline. Okay. Make them no except if you can. Yes, please. Okay. So here's like a simple meta function, like you could test whether or not a type is regular or not. When you design a class, you know, why not just add a static assert right after the class definition? Assert that my type is regular. You could even put it in the header if you want. Okay? There's something that's missing here. Does anybody know, aside from Sean? Equality, equality comparison. Okay. There is no is stood equality comparable. So uh, here's a, a, I also said there was going to be no template metaprogramming. So this is, you know, I'll gloss over this one. Here's how you implement it, right? Questions? No? Moving on. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's motivate this with an example. Let's design a type, and I'm going to call it uh, non-null unique putter, okay? Um, and it should be obvious what it is I want this type to do. Um, I default construct one by allocating an object, so it can't ever be null, right? Or, you know, I you know, bind one and assert that it's not null. I can get it. I don't have to check to see whether or not the putter is null, because I know it's not null. I haven't allowed that. And now comes time to implement the move constructor because it's unique putter and it should be movable because otherwise, what's the point? Um, so how does that work? What does the move constructor do? All right, so let's, let's rephrase, like the name of the class is non-null unique putter, so it should be obvious that this is the class invariant. Putter.get is not equal to null putter. All right. Here's like a move constructor where I steal the guts, oops, I set the other putter to null putter. Is that okay? Yep. If you have a precondition of get, the, the object that you're calling get on can be move, moved from, then this is fine. If you have a precondition on get that... The, the type, the, the object that you're calling get on cannot be moved from, could not have been moved from previously. Okay. Okay, so, so the precondition on move is this has never been moved from, or if it has, or if it has someone's assigned to it or something, right? That's, okay. So first of all, like, that would be in violation of the class invariant, which I have already stated is this, right? Well, it would be changing. It's changing stuff. Okay, so we are the authors of this class. We get to decide 
what the class invariance is and what are the preconditions on all of the member functions because it's our class we get to say that when choosing invariance and preconditions there are a couple of things to think about right the things to think about are like how what are my users going to expect from a type named non null unique putter okay it's also going to be like how hard is it to document this type because if the documentation is difficult to write then the class is difficult to use have you ever deleted a pointer and then used the pointer is that hard to document have you ever deleted a pointer and then used the putter that's exactly well what sure doing. sure it's yeah right if that's there's a correlation there. Sure. The, the yeah, and it's an error in both cases. Correct. Yeah. Chandler. So, so the, the, way, the way I kind of try to explain this is that a, a move from object, right, you, you, you can't call that the have a precondition. And the precondition can be simply, you know, that it is not in a move from state. Yeah. yeah. That's all the precondition has to say. And I think it's a valid precondition and an important one. Mm -hmm. We're actually uh, right now working to build a really nice set of static analysis tools around C++11 and, and types like unique pointer, where you can actually document which methods for your interface don't have preconditions and thus are valid to call on objects in a move from state. And we can get really, really helpful like static warning messages if you ever try to use a unique pointer after you move out of it. Right? And oh. I think, so I think this is, this is, it, it, it is a sensible kind of precondition to have. And, and I think we can even enforce it statically. So I, think, I don't think it's too hard to document. Okay, Chandler says, you know, that's, that's not an unreasonable precondition. We might be able to build tools that enforce it statically. Um, so we shouldn't get our underwear all in a wad about this. All right. Um, that's just like your opinion, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. what it references to into what it points to here. So like you say, you know, new T standard move value pointed to by other. Okay, so the, the observation was you could like dereference the pointer and like move the value in. Um, you'd so still you you'd right still right be right. allocating stuff here. So that so so here's here's the point. Like you can like move from an L value and now you have a type in your program whose invariants have been violated, as we have defined them. For a lot of people here, it's not a problem. I'm trying to say that it is. Yes. Yeah. You know, and you know, you don't have to believe me, okay, but I, I think there are good reasons for thinking that it's a problem, because um, it makes the invariants more difficult to state and makes the type more difficult to use. It seems the underlying question is, what are you allowed to do with the move from type? Yes. And, and, and so, so the, the committee actually has things to say about what you can do with a move from type. Like, that the type needs to be in a valid but unspecified state. Yeah, I think that even on a vector you can call clear that it's defined after it's moved. moved I think. And, but also assi assignment, I think, is always allowed. Right? You, can, you can call pushback after it. You just don't know what was before that last element. There's a certain amount of gray areas that I'm trying to say okay. that there are. And, and I think it's not clear because nobody has a, I mean, crisp understanding of what's supposed to happen afterwards. OK. So lots of differing opinions. I'm not going to, sorry. Yeah, go for it. Go ahead. I was just going to rephrase what you said because you said this is library design. This is library design. Factor, yeah. Isn't what you're allowed to do is move from object. It's what does the user of this object expect to be able to do with the object? Right? If it's been moved out of, it should not have an expectation that they can call get. They know they moved out of it. So it's not reasonable for them to expect get to work at that point. Okay. Or destroy, reassign. Sure. You can. So, so here's the thing about types that have their class invariance violated, right? Yes. yes, you you don't know whether or not a sign is going to work. Because moving oh, sorry. Uh, as a little bit as uh, 
am, I am, in a, I am as destroyed temporarily. <laughs> So there was, a, there was a long discussion in the standardization committee about like, okay, does a move from object, does, what are the requirements that need to be fulfilled? Like, does it have to be valid or do you just have to say like, it's destructible, right? And for a while, people thought, well, the type just has to be destructible, okay? That's not where they landed, right? Yeah. yeah. Chandler. Yeah. So this is actually a, a, a bit strange, right? You have two different invariants that are being stated in one line here. This is stating both that you can always call dot get on this type, that is, dot get has no preconditions, and that when you call it, the result is not null. I see. Right, right. And once once you understand that there that that's a dual class invariant, right? Like I think everything else you're saying makes a lot more sense as to why, why this is challenging. And, and my, like, my only comment is that, like, I don't think the first of those two should be there, right? Should, like, I'm not set, but it's still a useful example. Right? Yeah. Okay, Chandler's point is, you know, I'm, I'm actually conflating things here because in my class invariant, I'm also saying things about the requirements on get, um, which is a valid point. Yeah, one last question about this. just that git never returns a null pointer. Oh, well, that's a really interesting and question. And then lazily point to a dummy object. Get, yeah. OK. But so not during the loop, because then the loop will throw, right? Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah, OK, you could. So, so what I'm saying is that the move from object must be in a valid but unspecified state. And you could imagine implementing it like, OK, we'll allocate a new object and swap, right? But then, that's not very good. It's um, you know no different than a copy constructor, and uh, well, it can't be no except. But you know, well, you know, that's not a deal breaker. Um, so so what I would say is that either non-null unique putter doesn't have a natural move constructor, or this type just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? And it's kind of interesting that that's something that that at least I thought at first might be a meaningful thing that when you reason about it from at least from my viewpoint of like how move constructors and invariants interact that the type itself just doesn't make a great deal of sense yeah but the non -non unique pointer is an interesting example but it's specific in that you can always observe get mm -hmm. it gives you this pointer but there's lots of types that their internals act exactly like this type only you don't get to see it, namely every single pimple type in existence. They all have a pointer to some other object, and they don't really ever want that pointer to be null. Unless F, you, you, you implement every function of that pimple object so that it can act if the pimple pointer is null, so, which might be difficult depending on what mm, the object does. For sure. So, 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 so there's, I, I, have the problem that I had, a t I had a type, and it made total sense. And then I said, but I, I have an important reason, like compilation barrier, to make this a pimple. And the sudden I couldn't implement move anymore. Hmm. Yeah. And, and nothing changed in the purpose and the interface of the type. So how could I say, well, move just doesn't, doesn't make sense, or this type doesn't make okay. sense? OK, so uh, the point is, like, this isn't the only type that would have this problem. There is uh, this pimple idiom, right? Where you take the guts of the object, you put it off on the heap as like just a compile barrier, right? To make compile times faster. And instead of like what you would have been doing, which is moving individual elements, which are it's presumably no throw, right? Now I have, like I want to steal the guts from this other thing, right? Um, and that's kind of a, this other thing which is allocated on the heap. Uh, like how do you implement a no throw move constructor with pimple? Uh, and the answer is I really don't think you can. Because I mean you, you have to allocate the pimple, right? So that's not no throw. You can in a specific case. You can if you can implement all the concept methods of that object so that 
they don't need the pimp. If they can just say, well, I'm in this move from state, I know I just return zero. Okay. And with with a really. So, so if your pimple object has knowledge of the thing that's being pimpled, then, then you could uh, assign like default behaviors in case the pointer is null. So yes, you could do that. Yes. Good. <laughs> Excellent. So go to, uh, yeah, go to Sean's talk. So, so could you change things so that get throws uh, if the class invariant is broken? No, if it's been moved from. If it's been moved from. Keep, keep the invariant. Oh, geez. Um, so, so what is the invariant here? The invariant is. Get never returns a null pointer. Okay, if this is your invariant, then throwing on violations of class invariants is just a really bad idea. And I'll tell you why. Because um, when your class invariant has been broken, it means most likely that somewhere in your program there is a bug. And you are probably in an invalid state, right? You can no longer trust the state of your program. Maybe the heap is trashed. Maybe the stack is trashed. Maybe, I don't know, whatever. You've had a security intrusion or whatever. Throwing an exception is going to execute a tremendous amount of code in an invalid state. You don't know what's going to happen, right? If there is any violation of a precondition violation of a, a, a precondition or, or a class invariant, probably the best thing to do is just to fail. That's an assert. Die. That's my opinion. Okay? Oh boy, hands. <laughs> I've, I've said something really controversial, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, my question would be to you, and maybe this is where you're going. Why move this thing? It's a pointer. It's not going to give you anything. It's, it's, it's an ownership. So the question is, why move it? It's a pointer. Well, unique pointer is, is intended to be movable. Now, you could say, well, non-null unique putter doesn't make sense, but a non-null scoped putter that is immovable makes perfect sense. Okay? Yeah. Yes. So that means we cannot reuse null to represent the state of a non-null unique putter. Which means if you really want to implement this, you can just add a boolean field to say whether this pointer is in a valid state. So the point being that um, you can add an additional state to your object that represents the moved from state. Um, which is essentially the equivalent to setting the pointer to no. I mean, that's your, that's your Boolean, right? After being moved, you can always do get, but the thing you get does not imply any ownership. It's implementation specified. You would... You would have to encode that in your invariants and preconditions, that that, that was an allowable state. Yeah. I'm, I, I would love to discuss this further, but I have a lot more slides. And, uh, so I'm, I'm going to move on. Sorry. OK. All right. So here are my guidelines. The move from state should be part of the class's invariant. I think we can all agree on that. No? <laughs> Okay, not Sean. Go to Sean's talk. Um, 
Guideline seven, if guideline six doesn't make sense, the type isn't movable. And a corollary, every movable type should have a cheaper to construct valid default state. Okay. But Sean's gonna say this is all wrong. <laughs> all right, some wrong, okay. So now I just wanna talk uh, about modules um, uh, and larger scale design issues and what C++11 has to say about them. So here's an example of good modules and bad modules. I'm gonna hope that's not controversial. Um, yeah. So what does a C++ have to offer for enforcing, say, acyclic hierarchical physical component dependencies? Or decomposing large components into smaller ones? Or achieving extensibility or versioning? Um, really nothing, nothing at all. Um, we don't have module support yet, although they say it's coming. Um, we don't even have support for DLLs or in shared objects, right? Um, no explicit support for versioning of interfaces and implementations. Um, and so there's no solution for the fragile base class problem. So that kind of sucks. So you might wonder like, what am I going to say about C++11 and, and modules? Um, not much. Um, but there are a few things that we could say. We did get a little bit. <clears throat> so let's talk about library versioning when you've done, um, when you wanna make some interface breaking changes to your library. So imagine we've got this library and you know, we were good citizens so we put it in a namespace and we've got you know, a type and a function and a template um, that we intend for users to specialize. Okay, and we wanna evolve, evolve it to something else, you know? Say, I wanna change the layout of the foo object, right? Or I wanna add a default parameter, defaulted parameter, or you know, a new overload, right? How do we deal with this when we're evolving a library? So you know, we might say, well, okay, let's just stuff everything into a V1 namespace and have a V2 namespace and slurp all the V2 stuff out into the outer namespace, okay. This breaks some stuff when we do this. Um, so, well, first of all, we're breaking binary compatibility, but you know, I'm not really gonna worry too much about that. But here, for instance, if V1 has, uh, no, okay, if V2 has uh, templates in them, you won't be able to specialize them just by opening the lib namespace. And, and here's what I mean by that. So say we've got this situation, lib, namespace, traits, using, slurp it all into the outer, okay? And now we've got some struct that's mine. Now I wanna specialize the traits uh, uh, template on my type. Well, this doesn't compile because this template doesn't actually live in this namespace. It lives in that one, okay? So the committee gave us inline namespaces and that solves this problem, okay? So we say inline namespace v2, everything in this namespace is automatically exported into the outer one, and I could just open lib and specialize the traits. That works. Okay, that's at least one problem solved. Any questions about that, inline namespaces? Yeah. Oh, how does this change in the face of ADL? Um, I think inline namespaces are transparent to ADL. This is not ADL. There's no ADL going on here. This is just template specialization. Yeah. Yep. sure what it's called, but basically when, you, when ADL refers to, to an inline namespace, the standard basically says, 
Well, go up until you reach a non-inline namespace, and then, then take that and all its inline namespaces, okay. the inline namespaces within that, and treat them all as one lookup context for ADL. Okay, so, so the, um, the word for that is associated namespaces. Okay, so what will happen uh, when you define traits here, so imagine this, this wasn't a template, imagine it was a, t a type, okay? Every type in C++ has, like, bolted onto the side, a list of associated na namespaces, okay? If I have namespace A, namespace B, struct S. Since S is in B, which is in A, B and A are associated namespaces of S, okay? That means whenever I call a function and pass it an S, and if that function call is not qualified, non-qualified, then ADL is going to happen, right? So it's going to look in namespace B and A because those namespaces are associated with S. Now the point here with inline namespaces is, so if this is a function, then this is an associated namespace and this is an associated namespace that's as before, but also, if there is another inline namespace down here, inline namespace V3, then that is also an in, uh, associated namespace. Did I get that right? Okay, good. Thanks. Phew. Learned something new. Yes? A question. Um, when we use version Nine namespace. This is uh, great right for this library. Mm -hmm. we have version two, one and two, both available, and one is the default. <laughs> but when I have another library that is using this one, mm -hmm. that has not been changed, mm -hmm. it's not version, but it's using types that are defined in this. Right. Okay. So, so there is there's a, definitely a migration problem for your consumers, for the, the users of this library. So if a user of my library says, writes this code, right, right, what they might not be aware of is that they are implicitly opening a version namespace, v1. Okay. And now if you, if you change the library so that, oh, okay, v, v1 is the old badness now it's v2, and v2 is inline, and v1 is not, well, this code could break, okay? So, I mean, it is a problem for your consumers, uh, and there's, I've, I've thought of this problem, and there might be hackish fixes. You could use the preprocessor to select which namespace is inline or not, you know, and you could tell your clients, like, hey, if, if you're still stuck on v1, define this, and you will get all of V1 in the inline, inline namespace, right? Otherwise, you'll get V2. It's ugly. It's the best we've got, as far as I know. I don't know of a better solution to that problem. I hate recommending the preprocessor. Yes, me too. Yeah. Okay. Other questions about inline namespace? No? Okay. So guideline eight, put all interface elements in a versioning namespace from day one, right? This is not something that's easy to stick back in, right? So as soon as you write a piece of code that you expect to be reusable and you want to ship a library, put it in an inline version namespace, okay? And whatever the current version is, make it inline and maybe do some pre-process hackery so that users uh, don't get caught out by this when they migrate, when you migrate out from under them. Yeah. Okay. So, one other thing with regards to, um, with regards to like larger scale uh, software design in C++ and C++11 is, um, is ADL and, and name hijacking. And, and this isn't a problem that's, that's specific to C++11. I just wanted to stick this in there. Um, so uh, I'm going to briefly describe the problem of name hijacking. Most of you, maybe some of you, already know what the problem is. So say you've got a range, it's got begin and end, and you've got begin and end free functions 
that just return the begin and the end. Right? Simple enough. And this is in a range namespace. Right? So say I could say, all right, I got a, a range of int stars, and I could use a range based for each on that and output every integer in the range. What could be easier? Okay. Now imagine I have another namespace called tasks, and I have a task with a begin, because you might want to begin a task, okay? And maybe you write a free function that's called begin, and it takes a task-like thing, and it calls the begin member function on my task, okay? This is how I start doing my work. I call it begin. What happens over here? Well, you've got a range of task pointers. Okay. That should be okay, right? I'm going to be calling begin on this thing, which isn't a task, right? It's a range. So I should be calling begin on the range. You would think it'd pick this one, right? Because it's a range. Nope. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, you know? unfortunately, because what happens, so we talked a little bit about associated namespaces. When you say range, the associated namespace of that is definitely going to be range, right? But if I say range task, this is a template parameter, and its associated namespaces get tacked on to this guy's associated namespaces. Oops. That kind of sucks, and it's a little surprising. So innocuous seeming code like this doesn't compile. In this sense, it kind of breaks modularity, um, which is why I've stuck it in the discussion about designing code in a modular sort of way. Yeah? Isn't it only selecting that because it's a perfect forwarding function, so it should have been enabled if or something? Right. So, so the point is, like, it got picked because it was a better match, because it's a perfect forwarding, right? It's a gotcha. Sorry, second gotcha. Yeah? Uh, it's not so much a question to you, but to everyone. I'm just curious. Has anyone ever wanted that? <laughs> space of a template parameter to be part of ADA. Has anyone here ever said, yeah, I need that? Yeah, I needed that. Yeah. I, I did actually, okay, so the question was, has anybody ever actually wanted this behavior where the associated types of a template parameter uh, get included in the associated types of the, the template? And I have actually wanted it, but for a very obscure reason that isn't true anymore in C++11. Um, and it would make your eyes bleed to, or ears bleed to hear about it, so I'll spare you. So you, it, I can't think of a reason in C++11 for this. Chandler. Mm. Participate. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of annoying, but it does come up. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, I, I, I heard a rumor that there's this person called Richard Smith who has a solution to this, and that he might he might eventually like write a paper or give a talk about it. I, I'll try and cause that to happen. Okay. So uh, Chandler said two things. Uh, one thing is uh, you might actually want the template parameter to you know the associated namespaces of the template parameter to become part of the associated namespaces of the template if you're writing a wrapper class and you want the wrapper class to behave as much like the thing being wrapped as possible, including having all of its associated namespaces. Uh, and the other point was that um, apparently uh, Richard Smith, who's a Clang developer and a brilliant guy, uh, has a solution for this. Um, and I'm curious. Yeah, okay. Any other questions about name hijacking? No? Okay. So what do we do about this? Um, well, uh, one solution is to put all of your types in ADL blocking namespaces and export them using, uh, you know, a using declaration. Okay? If the type is not in the same namespace as the function, then the function won't be found by ADL, I think. I tried this. It works. <laughs> yeah. By the way, it refers back to something you said earlier when you were 
repeated my comment about the associated namespace. Yeah. So if I have a namespace space boost namespace property tree, and within that namespace I have a type, then boost is not an associated namespace. Oh, I got it wrong. Okay, so um, sorry about that. Uh, good point. The, uh, the correction was that, um, and this is why I said I think, and I got confused. I confused myself. So the associated namespaces of task is tasks ADL. It's just this one namespace. It is not this namespace. However, if this were an inline namespace, correct me if I'm wrong, if this were an inline namespace, then it changes the equation, and task would have the inline namespace, the ADL blocking namespace, and the tasks namespace. And any other inline namespaces. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. This is a solution, but uh, it <laughs> before you were able to, to call begin of a task without uh, yeah. using the namespace. Now you are forced yeah. to use it. Yeah. So uh, the point being like, okay, now I can't ever just say begin and pass it a task and have it be found by ADL. Yes, that's true. And that's a perk. Okay. ADL um, is a very useful thing. For, it's a very useful thing in certain very limited circumstances. Okay. Most of the time though, you don't actually want things found by argument dependent lookup. Operators, yes. Customization points, yes. Anything else? No, not really. Which um, brings me to my second possible solution to this problem, okay? Make it a function object. So here's what I'm suggesting. Stop writing free functions. <laughs> The only function that you should ever write is the function call operator. <laughs> Except for customization points. And Gabby, yeah, go for it. Uh, uh, what kind of function? A reference to a function. Uh, what do you mean by a reference to a function? Or a reference to a function. ADL doesn't apply to a reference to a function. Oh, because it's because it's object like. Okay, so that's that's another solution, but it's kind of like this one, similar. Yeah, I put in ninety eight to nobody listens. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't expect anybody to listen to this either. But actually, this is how I write my code now, and it's extremely useful. Chandler. So you could actually hack that. <laughs> yeah. So this, the, the the question was. Yeah, yeah. The question, was, the, the observation was you can't take the address of this and expect to get a function pointer. But yeah, you, you got to do some cute metaprogramming stuff, which I've done, and it works. Works. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. We have 14. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't it be easier to just make that bind to a lambda? Okay, wouldn't it be easier to make it bind to a lambda? And I would love it if that worked. Lambdas do not have const expert constructors. I don't know why. <laughs> You're work are you working on it to give lambdas const expert uh, constructors? Because I would really like that, actually. I really would. And that's a great observation. Um, yeah, so the begin object can't ever be found by ADL and you know, Oh, by the way, yes, okay, so uh, variable templates. So say you uh, boost lexical cast, right? Say you want to say lexical cast int 42. Well, in C++ 40, uh, 14, you could actually do that with what's called a variable template. This, this is an object, lexical cast, right? But it, its type is a template instantiation. This is new, and it's really cool. And it, I don't know if the... Um, the authors of this paper had this use case in mind, but it's really, really awesome. It's really great. I love it. Thank you, Gabby. It's you, right? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool stuff. Okay. 
Hmm? Okay. So not only uh, are they not found by ADL, but if like phase one name lookup finds an object, then it's never going to do ADL at all. So no more name hijacking problems. And, you know, there's all this like, oh, you, you know, you've got to worry about like qualifying all of your function calls if you don't want ADL, right? You've heard that, right? People tell you, oh, qualify your function calls, you don't want ADL. Now you don't have to, right? If, if your functions are actually objects, then you could just call them as long as they are visible. You can just call them without qualifying them and not worry about ADL. It's pretty great. Yeah? So like, one disadvantage though is that it requires that you define all overloads of the function in the same place, right? Okay. So, so yeah, the, the point was you'd have to define all of your overloads in one point, at one, in one place. Uh, and that gets back to the point I said like, ADL is great for customization points. For extensible overload sets, yes, you need that. And so you have to continue writing free functions. But what you could do is you could write a function object that makes an unqualified call to a customization point. And then document the customization point and have everybody use the function object. And you'd use perfect forwarding for that. Okay? So also, these things are first class objects. It's interesting to know, to note that like, so we have all of these standard algorithms that are higher order algorithms like for each and accumulate. They expect you to like pass in some sort of operation, but for like std for each and std accumulate, like if you ever want to pass one of those to an algorithm, you can't because it's not a first order thing. You can't pass one of the standard algorithms. You have to instantiate it with types, which you can't really do portably. So if those were all implemented as function objects, you could just pass them around. You could stood bind them. You could pass them to other higher order functions. Uh, it makes it really nice, really nice. Okay, questions about that? You will get like, your coworkers will scream at you. What, what the hell are you doing, right? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Question all the way in the back. Yeah, I just want to point out another advantage of that is so you, you already can pass functions at, to, as, to, to higher order functions because they get used to a pointer. But what this allows is overload sets. You can effectively, if you do have multiple overloads, you immediately get the ability to pass it along to a higher order function. Yeah, so okay. So, so the point is, like, if, if you use, like, functions and, and passing, like, a you know, take the address of what essentially is a function template and have it automatically, you know, convert to a C style function pointer, then you lose polymorphism. With this, you don't. No. And one more benefit, depending on how you see it, uh, because now every function has its own specific type. Every template that you pass it to will get its own specialization, which may mean code blue, yeah. or it may mean specialized code that is made way faster, and then gets in line and completely optimized away, right? Right. So. Yeah, so passing function pointers, uh, the point is, like, that can be slow, you know? Whereas if you pass, you know, a type with a function call operator, that's often going to perform better at runtime, because you don't have to indirect through a function pointer. Chandler. I, not that, no, like. If, if, <laughs> so. So let me, let me amend that. If your compiler can't tell what, you, what the function pointer is pointing to. I, I have no idea where this case would actually come up. It shouldn't. Okay. Like, file a bug against your compiler if this actually happens, including the ones to me. Okay, okay. Yeah. I guess it comes up if the compiler doesn't inline the template. If it's, say, it's the sort. It's pretty complicated. I, I kind of wouldn't want the compiler to inline the sort. No, 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 it doesn't have to inline, it has to specialize. Like, so, so all you really want it to do is you want it to specialize for a particular comparison operation. And it does do that. Um, I remember when, when GCC made this change. Uh, GCC 4.5 would, would have the slow performance for a function pointer. I think it was 4.6, which implemented the kind of obvious um, transformation, which causes it to get the exact same inlining and, and performance oh, with function pointer and with a, 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 a constant function. 
Cool. Oh, that's that's pretty neat. Okay, so so Chandler. Okay, so Chandler says the performance is not something that uh, is a consideration. That it's going to be fast. Either way. Okay. Um, this could be done already on, on C++ uh, 98. This, this can be done in C++ uh, 98. Yeah. Um, you, you can't make them const expert, but you can make them global constants. Yeah. I just wanted to comment on what was said about uh, passing over load sets. Yeah. Uh, there's been a proposal uh, that hmm. would allow lifting, lifting a name into, into uh, an object. Yeah, so, so there was, um, there, there is a... So, so there is a proposal to, to automatically lift overload sets. Um, and it's, it's pretty nice, and I would love that feature. We don't have it, so you could do this. OK. Looks like we've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Oh, here's, here's uh, the guidelines for, for name hijacking. Um, here's one solution, like the ADL blocking namespaces, which I don't really like, or uh, global const expert function objects, um, which I think are really cool. I'm a convert. I hope you are too. Yeah. Are there any side effects that are kind of like for function objects, like link time side effects? Um, are there any uh, link time side effects? Uh, none that I know of. I don't know if this is going to affect compile times or link times or, or anything like that. Well, I mean, is the, will it actually reference an object? So will it reference the object or will it be compiled away? Yeah. Um, that's a, a great question for a compiler int implementer, and you know we've got one here. So Chandler, I'm thinking. Yeah. So like. Well, it's already static because it's const expert, which implies const, which implies static when at a global uh, namespace. Not in 2014. Not in 2014? Yeah. Const expert does I'll, not I'll imply be const. Because every, <laughs> every, every, every const <laughs> C, if you have a global variable, like namespace code, yeah. it's const C, then it immediately acquires internal linking. Yes. Unless it's, you stick external in front of it. Right, exactly. Yeah, so, so Gabby's point is like a global, so a, a, a constant at namespace scope, whether declared, declared with like const expert or const, implicitly gets internal linkage, which means it's as if you said static const. Yeah. I, think, I don't think that was the point made. The point made is that your operator, your call operator, is a non-static member function. Yes. You will get this argument. It does. And you're, wasting, static. you're wasting one register. Yes, possibly. No, no, no. The it's question possible. is whether the compiler can optimize it. No, and you can't because you, that's possibly. Possibly, but I'm not you're I'm unlikely to be that. burning a register for the this pointer. Chandler? You are definitely burning a register for this pointer. It's an external function. You can't change the signature of it. Okay? Second off, there are a lot of ABIs where the calling convention for a non-static member function is absolutely terrible. This function will perform orders of magnitude worse on 32-bit on windows. Yeah. Um, so really? Yeah. So for on wow. this particular point, we fixed this five. Uh, in the 90s for GCC, when SCL came in, everybody has to use less than function objects. And effectively, in 97, 98, it was miserable because you know you gain function objects to less than of eight, for example. Instead of having two arguments, you get three arguments and you put in the pressure. And uh, GCC did actually fix this with having a special internal node called MC object. And for that, it was new for that. The ABI still requires you to pass at this point. <coughs> it, so what happens is that's false. <laughs> <laughs> this, this sounds like a hallway discussion. Yeah, yeah. So apparently there's there's some uh, disagreement between the GCC 
devs and the Clang devs about whether this performs well or not. I, I guarantee you it doesn't perform well on 32-bit Windows. Okay. I, I, like, like, if it's, it's in a header. terrible there. <laughs> so if you're on 32-bit Windows and dear God. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's something to worry about, seriously. Like, it's a, it's a valid concern. Okay, question. Um, so obviously this lexical cast definition will be in the header. Um, yes. Since it has internal linkage because it's declared const expert, doesn't that mean that um, anything that references it from another inline function in the header is going to have ODR violations because it's referring to, you know, it's referring to different objects? Yeah, so uh, the, the point was you risk ODR violations doing this. And for those not, like, you know, uh, speaking the you know, official lingo, ODR is the one definition rule, which means that if there is a function uh, that takes the address of this guy, right, and does something with it, different translation units will see different addresses for this guy, okay? And if you're using that information, then you're in trouble, okay? There are ways around that. I have never found it to be a problem in practice. So it's not something that I actually lose sleep over. You could implement the address of operator. Oh. <laughs> don't, don't. <laughs> Chandler. So, so it, it also requires your, your linker to merge the hard way every single version of this in every single translation unit. It doesn't get to do, like it has to do identical code, code folding because they make them different. Cause your .o files to be seriously bloated, and your linker to either be very slow when it runs, or your executables to be really bloated. Okay. The point is that this could actually have implications on compile times and and object file sizes. Code, code, bloat, yeah. code bloat. That's possible. I haven't done that testing. Yeah. So if I put static here, but I mean that's you you can't make the you can't you can't make this static. you can do it. Define it as static, and then you have a minimal forwarding operator call operator, and that just gets in line. So now if I call a function, you have to say blah blah dot call. Oh no 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 no. Yeah, Gabby. <laughs> Where's the fun in that? <laughs> Gabby, get off my cloud. So, so the question was, why don't you just write functions? Yeah. 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 There are a lot of advantages um, and some disadvantages. So, pros and cons. Okay. Yeah. Would any of the disadvantages that we've just talked about still remain if you only did this inside of like a CPP file in a unnamed namespace? So, would you would you still have these problems if you only did it in in one translation unit? Um, and the idea is that you you'd kind of like these functions to be reusable and in headers, um, which is where most people you know, put their function, their, at least their forward declarations. Yeah, okay. Yeah, question all the way back. Yeah. Um, first off, I agree that this is useful. <laughs> and I don't think that it's, it's a simple just use functions. I think that the games are, are valid, and this is a pattern that, that, that comes up. It's not like this is entirely new. Um, and the second thing is, I'm not convinced that the ODR issue has, is as, a, as big a non-issue as it seems, hmm. only because I think that if you take, earlier on you had like a case where you were perfect forwarding a function object, yeah. and I think technically there, you can get ODR issues because you are taking the function by reference, in which case you can have multiple different references there. I'm not entirely sure of the wording of how ODR applies in that situation. So if, any, if at any point you're doing some kind of forwarding of those objects, you're going to hit ODR issues. 
Okay, so so two points that uh, that Matt mentioned. Um, it's a valuable technique in his, in his opinion. Thank you. And um, and the other thing is uh, ODR is a real issue. Um, and I agree, ODR is a real issue. I don't know how that would actually manifest at runtime, and I don't think it would. So so if you if you call, well, okay, you take. So, so you, you could you can instantiate two function you can instantiate a function template twice in two different tr translation units. Yeah, but they will have different names. In two different translation units, they'll have two different names. Because they are, because they're they're no, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about the function object itself. I'm talking about some other function template that, that say you are passing this global constant object to. Okay, right? It is going to have the address of this function in one translation unit, and in another translation unit, it's going to have the address of a different object, which doesn't actually matter because the object is empty, and it's going to have the exact same semantics, whichever one you choose. It's, I think the point, I All think right. the point that you're missing is you're calling it from like, if you, if you add one level of indirection, and you're doing this from another function that is you know, defined as a template or something along those lines, the way that that is written is one, I, I guess we have to talk about offline about this, but yeah. I, I, I do actually believe it is ODR, and I understand what you're saying there, but I, I, I'm pretty convinced that this is actually ODR. I, I, think, I think this is ODR. I think this is nitpicky, and the conversation is like angels on a pinhead. How many can we fit? Like Three. <laughs> <laughs> Three. Um, okay, there we go. Um, so really quick. Um, I'm, I'm done. Like, if you are inspired, right, here's a list of libraries that you could go hack on and make beautiful with C11. The happy faces. Oh, the, this is like where they exist today and where they don't exist at all, as far as I know. You know, these are all libraries that either need to be written or need to be ported to C11 and proposed to the standard. This is just my personal wish list. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> the point was we have an I.O. library, and I disagree. Um, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I disagree. I get bug reports all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Close won't fix. This doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> they won't stop the bug reports. <laughs> and here's where you can go for more information, and uh, that's it. Okay. Uh, I'm all done. Uh, if you have any questions? Marco doesn't teach this <laughs> we, We'd like an I.O. library. It, it's okay if it has this bug. We just want one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for coming, guys. <laughs>